John chapter 4 this morning, and we're starting a brand new series, which is sort of like Christmas for a pastor, I guess. It's kind of like unwrapping a present. And, uh, but John chapter 4, we're starting a series called The Domino Effect. That's not a, a, a homage to uh, really cheap Italian eatery foods. Okay, that's not what that is. That's Domino's. Okay, or if you want to be really fancy, what I call it, Domino's. <laughs> but anyway, that's just for you to make you feel better eating that. Anyway, uh, but this is called the domino effect because I'm really amazed in my life the more that I realize this truth, which is that very, very small actions and very, very small words, and you know this, have a ripple effect and have, a, have, a, have an effect greater than you can even imagine. You've heard it said before that if somebody's having a difficult day, many times all they need is a smile and uh, it's so good to see you today. Many times that can, that can be a life-saving thing for, for a child that's in, in, their, in their school years being bullied. They need somebody just to come alongside and say, I'm glad that you're here today. Will you sit by me and lunch? It can make a lifetime of difference for somebody. And I think that the Bible teaches us that very small actions have greater effects than we can possibly imagine. And I wonder one day when we get in heaven and we realize as we're standing before Jesus the actual great effects that our, our actions, our thoughts, or our deeds did. And, and the, the, the amazing part of this, I almost wanted to entitle this, this sermon series something different that, that was all on positive actions, but I got to thinking about it, and really the negative is as true as the positive. That, that, that one set of gossip, that one set of snide remarks, that one set of, of hatred can really devastate much further than you thought it would it as well. So not only is this domino effect something that's for the positive, but it's also something for the negative as well. That our negative actions, our, 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 our sin towards God and others are much more longer lasting than we think they are. And I really wanted to illustrate this for you, but I don't have the means to do it. So I'm just going to tell you, you have to use your imagination. So I saw on Facebook, and this is really what started me down this direction. It had nothing to do with the Lord, but it was just a science experiment that I saw on Facebook. And it was a guy that held up a really small domino. So you're going to have to imagine that I'm doing this for you today. Okay? So he held up a really small, this is much easier than to you know, make it all than just tell you. So <laughs> he held up a really small domino and he said, now can you imagine this domino? And then he walked to the very end and there was a giant thing off the ground about this tall of the same equal weight and size according. And he said, can you imagine this knocking that over? And the obvious answer is no. But here's the interesting thing about dominoes, and, and you know as well as I do, when you buy the game dominoes that the parents might play for a little while, but you know, you know your favorite thing to do with dominoes <laughs> is to set them up and knock them over. I don't know about you, but I, if that was like for my livelihood, I'd have to quit to find a new job. That is the most stressful thing. I'm like the world's worst person. That. I mean, I'm shaking towards the end, and I try to leave a space strategically, and by the end, I knock it over with my elbow, and it goes off before it goes. I'm really, really bad at it. But I had a lot of fun as a kid setting up dominoes. And you remember when you got really fancy with that as a kid, and it would kind of go and go in a circle and come back, and you're like, oh, man, that was awesome. Remember that? <laughs> Maybe the last one would fall off the table and land in a bucket. Man, I remember doing all those things. But, but this is the idea this morning as far as the domino effect goes. It's not just one domino knocking over another domino of equal weight or size. But this, this man's idea on Facebook was that you could have a domino of, of a certain size, and it will actually, it will knock over another domino twice the size of the first one. And then when that one begins to get momentum, it knocks over one twice the size of that one. And it kept going and kept going until towards the end, in probably only about 10 dominoes, it was knocking over one about as tall as him of an immense amount of weight and size. And I got to thinking about that, and I thought, and isn't that our life? That we can make such a small investment in somebody and you never know what's going to happen with that. Or you can cut someone down and you never know what's going to happen with that. I think about Brother Dan as we celebrate his mom's life this morning. I wonder all of the things that she did that she's now finding out in eternity that this small action or this money given or this, this, this skill that I lent to you or I gave you this time or I gave you a kind word or I took the time to listen to what you had to say. I've never met her, but I have met her son. And you're one of the finest people I've ever met, Dan. And I know she did an awesome job. That doesn't just happen by accident. She must have been an amazing person to invest her life in Dan. 
And I wonder if we could be where she is right now and understand the things that she knows about eternity right now. How much more would we get involved in investing our lives in people in the positive way? And I'll just tell you from my end, as far as being in ministry, that there are times that, that, that somebody says something small to me that I lose sleep over. And that's a part of me maturing in the Lord and giving it to Him. But as a, as a pastor, you've got to understand, not only do you pour your life into people, but also uniquely you get your livelihood from it. And so sometimes in ministry, and that's why I'm really excited to be part-time here, to be honest with you. But anyway, God is good. But anyway, when, you, when you invest your life into people and somebody comes back and says, well... Me and some people are talking. We're just concerned about some things that you're doing. Let me just tell you what that does to a pastor. No sleep for sure. On top of some ulcers in there somewhere. And then a full, and a full uh, a repentance and giving it to God. And say, God, forgive me for not trusting you. It's devastating. And you learn to build up a callus when you love people because of the things that they say. It's such a negative effect. And we do this to each other without thinking it. Because we want to be right and we want to prove our way. So this idea of the domino effect of your small action affecting something twice its size and eventually doing something you never dreamed of can go both towards the positive and the negative. And the Bible gives us all of these incredible examples. And this morning, we're going to be in John chapter 4. Now, let me just say as we get started, I know you're familiar with this chapter. I believe most of us probably are. And as I tell you, Fairly often, I'm not here to teach you the story, although we will go over it. I want to teach you some surrounding things in the story that maybe you haven't noticed. John chapter 4 is an incredible chapter. If you hold your place in John chapter 4, I'd like for you to go to the very back of your Bible if you have a set of maps. Head to the maps. Let's look at the maps for a second. All right. So if you can see the maps, I want to show you a little bit. Now, the map that you're looking for, if you have multiple maps, is you're looking for the map entitled something like Palestine during the days of Jesus or during his ministry rule or something. Ministry of uh, uh, life. Something to that effect. Palestine or Israel during the life of Christ or the ministry of Christ is what you're looking for. Now, if you find a map that's like that, you're going to find it's going to be sectioned off and have different names to it with its different areas. And if you find it done like this, you're going to see that it's done with Judah. And then you're going to see to the extreme north of Judah is Samaria. And to the north of Samaria is Galilee. Does anybody find that on their map? You can see you're saying, all right, some people are following that. Everybody find that okay? So if you look and you find the Dead Sea in the south of Israel, the, da the Dead Sea, and you look just to the west of the Dead Sea, you're going to find uh, the area or the region of Judea. Now, I want you to notice that, that, that the, the, the Jews had no dealings, as you know, with the Sumerians. They believed for them to be people that were mixed with Jews and Gentiles. They were culturally different. They didn't like them for a variety of reasons. We're going to go over some of those this morning. But, but you know, if you look at your map, many times when the Jewish people would travel all the way to the north by Galilee, if you look at your map, they would cross over the Jordan River. They would travel in Perea. And go that way and bypass Samaria altogether. So this is the normal route for a Jew. But Jesus says he has to go to Galilee. When he says this, he's standing in Judea. And he says, I must needs go through Samaria. Right? Okay. So now that you have that, you can reference that if you like. But go back to John chapter 4. And you kind of have an idea of where we're going. John chapter 4, verse 1. Now, we're going to read a lot today. I, I, I try to limit it to about 10 verses. I can't do that today. But we're going to make some commentary along the way. But look with me if you would. Because this story is such a living example of how we can pour our lives into other people. John chapter 4, verse 1. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John. I want you to notice the context of what we're talking about. And by the way, I think it's so wonderful that the Bible here never says how Jesus knew that. You notice it just says he knew it. It doesn't say somebody told him. It just says he knew it. The Bible assumes the omniscience of God. Verse number two. Though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples. Verse number three. He left Judea and departed again into Galilee. Remember what that verse is saying there in verse three. You now know from looking at your maps that those two aren't connected. In between those two is Samaria. So he left Judea to go into Galilee. And the Bible says in verse 4, he must needs go through Samaria. But see, that's different than what the average Jew did. They didn't must needs go through Samaria. They went through Peoria to go up through the, the eastern side of Israel. 
They bypassed it altogether. But the Bible says that Jesus must needs go through it. And, and I wonder this morning, if when Jesus prompts you, the Holy Spirit prompts you to do something, if maybe you could have some kind of a, a built-in thing, mechanism built into us to know that the Holy Spirit is prompting us to do something because He wants our life to be a life of a domino effect, even though it might seem like a small decision, we must needs follow Him. Even if it's not popular. Verse number 5. He cometh into a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now, if we had more time, and we were going in a little deeper with academia, we'd go into the Old Testament and look when, jo when Jacob gave this to Joseph, because you can actually go on Google Maps right now and probably find exactly where this is talking about. This is not a well that's in service today. It has a lot of debris in it, and it's been covered, but you can actually find where this is. Uh, there was a missionary that, that went and found this, and he gave a first-hand account and said it's about 100 to 150 feet deep, but you can find it still today. And so this, this well is so in interesting because if you follow the history of this, this parcel of land, the Bible calls it, this, lot, this is exactly where a lot of Baal worship took place through the Old Testament. So since the, the genius of the Holy Spirit is to give us a historical account of what's going on here geographically, we can follow this parcel of land all the way through to this moment. Some really interesting stuff happened here. The Bible says in verse 6, Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well and was about the sixth hour. That's about noon. The Jewish day starts at 6 a.m. So the sixth hour will be around noontime. Jesus has been traveling and he finally finds his way here. And we could probably do the mileage and find out. He traveled somewhere around 30 miles or so. He finally gets to this resting point on his way into Galilee and sits down by this well. Now, as he's sitting here by this well, the Bible says in verse number 7, then cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. And Jesus saith unto her, give me to drink. Now, a couple of observations here. Number one, Jesus is the living water. He spoke things into existence. God is so much more powerful and he's so much more terrifying than anything that we can fathom this morning. And anything that we think uh, we can't handle, he can handle easily this morning. But he asked himself for something, something to drink. Hey, can I get some, some, some water from you? Now, this is a way for us to understand how we can do this domino effect. We need to look for ways to help people's life. Jesus didn't need water from her, although he was thirsty legitimately. But he could have figured out water on his own. But he asked her for some water. It was an opening statement. It was a way to get into her life. If we would be more uh, on purpose trying to do this domino effect, God will begin giving us more opportunities. So he asked her for a drink of water. The Bible says in verse number 8, his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria. Oh, now here is where it begins. This is just so amazing. So just follow along, even though you know the story, because there's a, there's a kicker at the end in this thing. So please pay attention. The Bible says, this, the woman says to him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, ask us a drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? The Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. So her first question is not, oh, you're thirsty. Oh, how long have you been traveling? Uh, can, I, can I get you two glasses? She doesn't have anything to do with Jesus' immediate needs. She says to him, wait a second, you're a Jew. I want you to notice a couple of things that, that we, can, we can talk about this morning as far as being some roadblocks to having an effective domino effect life. One of the things this morning I want you to notice right off the top of, right off the bat, she says, how, that, that say it, the woman of Samaria, how is it, and by the way, let's just stop there for a second. If we live our lives in this way, that Jesus is, which is going out of our way, maybe even out of our comfort zone, to have this domino effect, we should live our lives for other people to say, how is it? Isn't that a great way to live? I used to call it the why factor. You want people around you to go why and ask you a question about your life. We have such an advantage on the lost over us because you're a peculiar person to them. You can lose your mom and have peace. How is it you could go through that? Wait, you just 
You just got gossiped about at work, but you know, you're, rather than getting angry in your workplace, you said, you know what, it probably just means she had a rough day. I think I should probably pray for her. If you do that in your workplace, you're going to be like an alien. You might as well have antennas coming out of your head because no one's going to understand that. You will be so foreign and somebody may laugh at you, but they're going to go back to the break room and see you reading your Bible and they may look at you and scoff at you, but they're going to go home and say, something's different about that dude. Something's di I've never seen anybody handle that like that. They're going to say, how is it you can do that? So she comes to Jesus and she says, first of all, how is it that thou, being a Jew, askest a drink of me? Now, I want you to notice a couple of things. Number one, she says, how do you ask this of me, which am a woman? Right? So we'll just say, here's a, here's a couple of things that are pertinent to today. Right? These are things we see on Fox News today. Right? There's a lot of things about this idea of gender equality and all this stuff. I have a book in me that I desperately want to write. If I tell you the title, you won't steal it, will you? Okay. <laughs> so I have this title in my head. Oh, turn, yeah, turn. <laughs> but anyway, I, I, I know I'm going to write this book, and it seems like uh, it's in my head. I really want to do this, and it's just called it's just called equally different. It's not a good title for a book. Equally different, because you know what the, the reality is that men and women, according to God, are equal, but they're different. Right. One's not more important than the other. They're different. Why are they trying to take their weaknesses and pretend like they have our strengths? And why do we want to take our strengths and pretend like we can do their strength? It doesn't. We're different. But when my wife and I come together, we become a superhero team. And we understand that she's really good at some stuff and I'm good at some stuff. We bring those together. If I look at her weaknesses and say, why aren't you as good as me and my strengths? That never is going to make sense. And so the first thing she says is, I'm not the same gender as you. You know, one of the things Jesus doesn't do here is Jesus doesn't get in an argument. One of the ways that we can have a domino effect on people's lives is to avoid needless arguments. I, I, I told somebody on, actually, the, my pastor I grew up with posted a question on Facebook and he said, he said, what is your greatest prayer for your church? He just put it out there. Not to me, but just to everybody. And I thought about that. Wow. To really have one. And I thought, and this was my answer. I said, I want my church to be more concerned about persuasion than being right. Isn't that good? Because, you know, there's a lot of churches who can say, well, I'm sorry, but that's just the truth. <laughs> and guess what? They're not persuading anybody. I'd rather be more known as a persuasive church than a correct church because you can do both. But it's the way that you present it, right? And so the first thing she says is, I'm a woman. Look what else she says in verse number nine. I'm a woman of Samaria. I'm a woman of Samaria. Now, I'm going to put a word up here that I don't even believe in. But I'm going to do it because it's the vernacular of today. So I'm going to have to teach through this. But the first thing she says is my gender. The second thing she says is my race. I don't even believe in that word. I have an easy way to fix the problem of racial relations today. You know what it is? It doesn't even exist. That's the answer. Because the Bible said that there's one race... It's the human race. You know where this word came from? This is an evolutionary term, meaning people aren't all the way human. It's not race. It's hate is what it is. It's prejudice. But these are some things that we see on the news today. You know what the reality is? When I see somebody who has any darker skin than me, which is like everybody, some, like Casper and whoever was my grandparents. Anyways, um, very white. Anyway, <laughs> whoever's, whoever's darker in pigmentation than me, it's, they're not a different race. We are the same race. We're an Adam's race. Somehow we've gotten away from that. They're not partially human and I'm not partially human. We're all made in God's image. So she says, I'm a woman. I don't have the same uh, color of skin as you. I'm not the same race as you. The Bible says in verse number 9, For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Now Jesus answered her, and I want you to notice in verse number 10, he could have said anything. He could have said, you're wrong on that. Or he could have said, I challenge you with this. This is just what he said. If thou knewest the gift of God and who it is that say to thee, give me the drink, thou wouldest have asked of him and he would have given thee living water. I want you to notice that Jesus, with such a genius way, navigated around the intellect and got right towards the heart of the issue. Jesus didn't take his time arguing. In fact, it says in 1 Timothy, as Paul's writing to young Timothy for ministry, he says, here's some things you need to avoid. And one of those things was endless genealogies, vain janglings. It means useless things that have nothing to do with the kingdom. That people want to sit and argue that have, that have no consequence whether you're right or not. 
And he says, focus on the things that matter. And Jesus did just that. He said, listen, if you knew who I was, you would in turn ask me for living water. Well, that's a great opener. I don't recommend trying that when you're witnessing this week. Yeah, if you knew who I was, you'd ask me for living water. But Jesus can get away with it. The Bible says, verse 11, the woman saith, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Remember we said earlier that missionary said about 100 to 150 feet. From whence then hast thou living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well? Yes. And drank thereof himself and his cattle, his children and his cattle. Well, if I'm Jesus, this is why I always tell you I'd be such a terrible God. Because I would be like, actually, uh, yeah, I am greater. And I made all this. And who are you to talk to me that way? And I hope that you like flights to the moon. Because whoosh, I just watch her. And she's like, I'm sorry. You know, I would be a really bad God to do stuff like that all the time. And that's why I'm not. And he is. Okay, so anyway. So she says, are you, you, think, you mean to tell me you think you're better than Jacob? And Jesus says in verse 13, Whosoever drinketh of this water will thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. I want you to notice the focus of Jesus not getting sidetracked on who's better. This is in a lot of ways like Matthew 4 where Satan's trying to tempt Jesus. You notice when he says, you, you want to be exalted, I'll exalt you. You want to prove that you're the Son of God. He never said, yes, I am. And you know it. You were, I made you. You remember me. He never said that. He just said, it is written. He went to the Bible every time. Three times in a row, Satan brought to him, brought to him the lust of the flesh, the lust of, of the eyes, and the pride of life. Right in a row, if you look at it. And right in a row, Jesus says, it is written, it is written, it is written. He quoted scripture every time. And I want you to notice, if we're going to have a domino effect in our lives in a positive way, then we're going to have to give up a lot of the emotions that we feel like we're entitled to, to settle the score in our life. It's just the way it is. It's this incredible truth that the Bible says that if we pray for our enemies, that God will change our hearts towards them. If you have the ability to pray for somebody who, who, who despitefully uses you, as the Bible says in Isaiah 53, we're going to greatly impact this world for Christ. But if we have the idea that we want to get even with people, we're going to have a negative impact. The domino effect will go the other way. Verse number 15. The woman said unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. So she wants the gospel. She wants eternal life. She's desiring to have it. He's got the conversation to the point where he's influenced her enough by his answers that she's now intrigued by how she can get this everlasting life. And I want you to see the masterful way he does this. The Bible says... He said, go and call thy husband and come hither. And you guys know this, but I want you to notice this encounter here. Because this encounter later has everything to do with what we're talking, talking about. He says, go and call your husband and come back. She says, she says, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands. And he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that said, thou truly. He's like, you are technically right, but let's settle the score. You don't have a husband, you've had five. And the dude you're shacking up with right now, you guys don't have rings on your finger. So let's just settle the score real quick. And she says something very perceptive. She says in verse number 19, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. You think? <laughs> this is before social media. He didn't just go up and look on, you know, who's nearby and looked up the about. She says, I perceive you're a prophet. Very, very well perceived. But I want you to notice, after she made this concession to him, that you're a prophet, in verse number 20, I want you to notice that even in the days of Jesus, and I hope that you allow the Holy Spirit with this truth right here to minister to you, because it's very, very important for what we're doing in our church. I want you to notice that even Jesus hadn't even gone to the cross yet. He hadn't resurrected yet. And I want you to notice her question. She said, I perceive you're a prophet. So rather than saying, I'm glad you're a prophet. I want to know more about this life. She begins to argue with current events of the day. She says, our fathers, the Sumerians' fathers, worshipped in this mountain. And ye say, now she's grouping him with everybody together that's a Jew. And ye say, she doesn't even know him. And ye say... 
That in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. What she means to say is that Jerusalem was the usual place where the Jews worshiped together. And Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe thou... Now I want you to notice also, Woman, he says this to Mary a few times. And I want you to know that if I were to talk to my mom like Jesus talked to Mary, in today's world, in today's vernacular, somebody would have to call an ambulance because I wouldn't remember what happened after that. If I said, Woman, be the last thing that I remember. So that's not going to happen. But I want to bring this into context so you don't think that Jesus is being rude. In context, he's calling Mary by her created name. What he was trying to do is get Mary to understand that he's about his father's business. So he was calling Mary, not by a derogatory name, by, by trying to make her feel small. He was trying to get her to understand that I am creator, you are creation. And it's the same thing that he does with this woman here. He says, woman, believe me, the hour cometh when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. I want you to notice what just happened. This woman's first question, after she admits that she believes that he's a prophet, her first question is about mode of worship. Did you see that? That means before Jesus died, before the ascension in Acts chapter 1, modes of worship were controversial while Jesus was still alive. The number one question she had was, let's talk about the way we worship. I want you to notice is Jesus' answer. Jesus could have said, listen, woman. You need to have a piano and an organ on the right-hand side, or it's not going to be accepted by my father. He could have gone down and did, said exactly what the Jew, Jew said. He could have said his church preference, but this is how he answered. He said, he said here's, the broader, here's the broader question for you. The broader point to the woman is, this isn't something that you need to worry about. Why? Because your heart's not in it. That's what he said. He goes, you don't even need to worry about that question, whether it's in Jerusalem or in the mountains. Here's the bigger thing for you to chew on. Neither one of those apply to you. Because your heart's not in it. That's exactly what he says to her. He said in verse number 22, Ye worship, ye know not what, and, and know uh, what we know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. He said, if we know what's going on with the Father. The law was given to us. You're sitting there in church, and you're going through the motions. Man, you don't even know who you're talking to. That's your problem. It doesn't matter whether you're in the mountains or in a ski lodge or over at the temple. Your problem is you don't even know who you're talking to. That's the problem. Because when Jesus came, guys, he abolished formalized religion. Everything before Jesus came was about the way that you looked and about the way that you did things. When Jesus came, Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7 is the Sermon on the Mount. And in that, those three chapters, Jesus internalized the law. He said, you, you have heard it said of old that you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, if you even look on a woman, that's a totally different standard. Brand new. It used to be that I could think whatever I wanted to in my heart. Jesus said, you might as well have done it because you're disgusting to me. Totally different. He took an external law and he internalized it. <coughs> so he said, here's the problem. Verse 23, the hour cometh and now is. And I love this phrase with all my heart. When the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship Him. <clears throat> I, I te I'm tempted to rabbit trail here because it's like a sermon in and of itself, but just allow me uh, 30 seconds to say this. One of the greatest truths that I have for our church is that God in heaven is right now actively seeking for true worshipers. He is in heaven looking for anybody who will worship Him in spirit and in truth. <clears throat> i, I got to tell you this. When I was a kid... My church was very conservative growing up. And I remember the first time some weirdo came into our church and went like this while they were singing. And I just stared at him like, do they have questions? <laughs> like, the restroom is that way. You can go whenever you want. I had no idea what was happening. And I just saw them like this, and their, their eyes are closed, and I'm just going, oh, that is odd. And i got to tell you, then I got older and I went off to a college that was a lot different than where I grew up. And when I got to a college that was different than I grew up, they played the piano during while, while the pastor was praying. I, told, I, I sat there and I told the person next to me, I said, is talking to God not impressive enough? And I thought I was righteous and spiritual and saying, you have to play the piano in a synthesizer to make the emotions enough. We're talking to God. How much better does it get? And, and I felt like I had to leave the school over it. That's where I was at. And Cheryl just did it in a church that I can have influence over. I like it. But I was in there and I thought, man, you know what my problem was? 
my, my idea of worship was how did it appeal to me and how did I feel like I was appealing to other people in the room. I had no concept that when I worshiped the Lord, it was me and him and his throne. I didn't get that yet. And he's, this woman says, is it in the mountains or is it in Jerusalem? She, she says, you know, that doesn't even matter to you. You have no idea what you're saying because you don't know who you're singing to. I think a lot of the petty stuff that we have in churches will go away if we know who we're speaking to. The Bible says he's seeking for true worshipers. God is a spirit, verse 24, and they that worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Okay, there's a lot of meat there, but we're going to move on for the sake of what we're talking about. The woman saith unto him, <laughs> isn't this interesting? I know, <clears throat> I marvel, oh, sorry, let me give him a place. I know that Messiah is cometh, which is called Christ. When he has come, he will tell us all things. I wish I could be a fly on whatever was nearby to see the look on her face in the next verse when he says, yeah, I believe that too. And in fact, I that speak unto thee am he. Ooh. I'm sorry, what? <laughs> You're what? She's like, well, we can have this lovely discussion by the well over here. But I know that one day the Messiah will come. He's going to tell us all these things. He's like, oh, I, yeah, I've heard that too. Yeah, about the prophecies and everything in Isaiah and Daniel and Zechariah. Yeah, I've, I wrote that actually. That was, that was my book. I'm glad you liked it. It's a bestseller. <laughs> and I'm actually him. Wow. Wow. The Bible says in verse 27, And upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman. Now I want you to notice the disconnect between what I would call a spiritual victory, us pouring our lives into people and seeing the domino effect begin to start. And I want you to notice that the disciples who were not even a part of all that God was trying to do in the life of this woman who desperately needed to be loved, and they came in and said, why is he talking with her? I remember when I first became a youth pastor, I brought a youth group that didn't exist. There were zero teenagers. In about a year, we had about 16 teenagers out of, it didn't, didn't exist. And I met with them in some room, and we went on some camping, uh, 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 church camp week, and we went there. I was so excited. The church had never done anything like that before. I needed to borrow the church van, which didn't run, Brother Dan, if you can imagine that. Nobody used it. There was no purpose for it. We actually got it to fix it. You guys know how much I know about cars. I changed my blinker fluid. That's about it. <laughs> Less than nothing. Anything. So I got somebody else. No, it's blinker fluid if you don't know anything. So I got somebody's help to fix up this van. And uh, we got the van running. I thought that was a victory in and of itself. We went to this camp, and I had kids with me whose parents weren't saved. They knew nothing about church, and they went. Many of them gave their heart to Christ. I'm exhausted. I'm staying up till 2 or 3 in the morning. We're getting up at 7, doing camp for a whole I come back exhausted. I think that they're going to come by. And I'm, I'm, I'm 21 years old. I'm just fresh in ministry. And I, I imagine that the pastor of the church is going to have a church meeting and say, we need to tell Ken how great he is. Everybody stand with me. And listen, Ken, this, I'm anticipating this red carpet treatment from everybody. And I got a call the next day. My eyes are bloodshot. I'm exhausted. But I know that these teenagers, so many of them, did incredible decisions. They have a terrible home life. And for a week, I was able to shelter from that and show them about the greatness of God. And I got a call from our pastor. He said, some of the deacons have called me. We want to talk to you. And I thought, man, here it comes. <laughs> and he said the words to me. Some of us are concerned because they said, if Ken's going to use the church van, that's fine. But don't put it back where in the wrong parking spot. <laughs> I said, what? What? Is it when you came back, you put the van, we always put it right here, and the deacons are very, very sure that this is the best place, and they're just concerned that we park around. So if you're going to continue to use it, I said, yes, sir. <sighs> what? <laughs> You've got to be kidding me. After the week that I had, that's the phone call. I got. And I mean, God showed me from the beginning, you love me. You love people, and you do it because it's the right thing, and because I'm going to bless your life. And I imagine the disciples coming in at the end of the week of camp, after all these spiritual victories have been done and Jesus is in the trenches with this woman and the disciples are like, why is he talking to her? It's because Jesus knows the principle called the domino effect of doing the right thing even when it's hard and, and, and having your actions multiply much more than you can even imagine. The Bible says in verse number 28, the woman left her water pot. I want you to notice that the object of the whole point of the conversation isn't even in her, isn't even in her mind anymore. 
She went there to get water. And by the way, if you do the numbers, she lived eight miles from her. She traveled eight miles to go get water. But when she had a personal encounter with Christ, she left her water pot there. The whole point of her, her traveling got lost in the love of Jesus. And when she had a personal encounter with the Messiah, the creator of the world, she lost all sense of what was going on in her life because of the greatness of God in an encounter with him. Amen. The Bible said he, she left her water pot there. Look at verse number 20. The woman left, left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the men. Wait a second. What about this excuse right here? She left her water pot and now she went into the city and now she's getting the... You guys got to come here. You guys got to come here. And she's telling the men things now. And she says to the men, and by the way, as you see this, I want you to know that Jesus is alive today. These things that we're seeing, the Holy Spirit is still powerful today. These things that we see Jesus do, He'll empower us to do today. Right. So when we pour our lives into people, this isn't just John chapter 4 in a 2,000 year old book. This is the power of Christ today as we invest our lives in people. The Bible says she went and she saw the men and she said in verse number 29, Come, see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? The Bible doesn't say this part, but if I can add this for emphasis, the whole point of this passage is she's saying, Come, see a man which told me all the things that I ever did and still loves me. Amen. That's the point. And the disciples come up and they say, why is he talking to her? Man, Lord, let me never be in that camp that misses what you're doing. The Bible says, in the meanwhile, his disciples prayed, saying, Master, eat. They've been gone getting food. Jesus says to them in verse number 33, I have meat to eat that you know not of. In other words, can I say it this way? There's some things in this world that sustain me that you guys need to figure out. You've been gone getting food and then you come back and chastise me for talking to her. There are things that sustain me that are far more important than food. People are more important than food. And Jesus is saying, if you had an idea of what was going on, you would know that my meat, verse 34, is the, to do the will of him that sent me to finish his work. I wonder what our church would be like, what your family would be like, what your workplace would be like if we would just say, Lord, help me care more about people than food. Help me get filled up with what you've given me to do in this life. I want you to jump down and notice in verse number 39, we're almost through. The Bible says in verse 39, and many of the Samaritans in that city, please get this, believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified. He told me all that I ever did. What a small conversation. Wasn't there an easier route the Jews usually took? He could have gone east. He said, I must go find this woman who needs to know me and have a personal encounter with who I am. And the Bible says that she left her water pot, went back to her hometown, opened her mouth and became a witness for Jesus. And the Bible says that as she began to proclaim who Jesus was, People begin to believe on his name. But that's not even the greatest part. As we get to this idea of one action affecting another action, affecting another action that's greater. And finally, at the end of your life, you're like, wow, Lord, did you do that through me? I want you to notice, for me, the most powerful part of this whole thing. Look with me, if you would. In verse number 40. So when the Samaritans were coming to him, they besought him that he would tarry with them. And he abode there two days. They got together and Jesus came in and saw them and spent time with them. They're like, please stay with us. I mean, the woman said that you told her all the things that you ever did and you still loved her. And you're a Jew. We're so intrigued by the goodness of God. Are you the Messiah? Stay. We want to learn about you. Please don't leave. You know, the people that are around you right now that may not show interest in Christ. You just keep loving on them. You just keep sharing Christ. Just keep doing it. You say, why am I in a job where people around me curse God's name? That's why you were there. So many times you say, I just wish I could get a job where I'm not surrounded by such negativity. No, you're the light for the negativity. You're the positivity. That's why you're there. The Father strategically placed you in that place for that reason. It's not shouldn't be a mystery to us as followers of Christ. Why we get involved in an area that doesn't make sense to us. No, that's why you're there. So keep at it. Keep saying things. Keep opening your mouth. The Bible says here that they begin to talk and say, please stay with us. 
He abode there three days. Verse 41, the Bible says because of that, many more believed because of his own words. And here's my favorite verse in this entire thing. Verse 42 will be done in this verse. Listen to this. And said unto the woman, these are the people that believe, the many more that believe. They said unto the woman, now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves. Man, let that touch your heart. You know why I believe on him? Not because of your story about the well. But he came and I heard him myself. Now we're talking about a revival of an entire city. An entire city begging for the presence of God. And people's lives being changed. Not because they heard a story about a well. But because they heard him themselves a first hand account. He, he became known to them in a very real way. And he influenced them because of his presence. And the Bible says in verse 42. For we have heard him ourselves. And know that this is indeed the Christ. The Savior of the world. That's how you do the domino effect. You look past gender. You look past prejudice and hate. You obey Jesus. You get focused on the things that matter. And the Bible says that because of a simple act of asking somebody for a drink of water and not getting caught up in an argument and just showing the love of Christ to somebody and focusing the conversation, an entire city has a radical revival and comes to know Jesus as their personal Savior. You say, well, I'm just one person. Okay. But you have the Spirit of Christ in you. One conversation. Revival of a whole city. See, it might have been easier to go the other way. I don't know, maybe. This was actually a shorter route. I don't know what everybody's giftings are in the room, but I know this. If you fall on your face by yourself, you just say, God, use me. Use my, my small action to cause a greater effect down the road. I promise you, this morning, He is seeking for you. He is in heaven looking for true worshipers that will give Him His worth. This morning, He'll do that. I don't know what you're going through this morning, but I just can't get my heart to get off of Brother Dan and his family. I know this, that one day, and the day that's not very far away because life is fast, one day I'll have a funeral and I'll be the one in there. Instead of conducting one, I'll be the one in the box. That day's not very far away. If we're honest with ourselves, it's just not that far away. I remember in my mind when I was born, my brother was born in 72, I had a sister born in 76, and another brother in 78, and I was born in 81. I was always so happy because the 70s sounded like it was just such a long time ago. <laughs> and now that I'm older, I'm like, I'm almost dead. I mean, life is... <laughs> Listen, life is short though, isn't it? And the actions that we make can have a domino effect either towards the positive or the negative. I just want to implore you one day, when your day comes and you stand before the Lord, you can look at Him and say, Lord, thank you for using me. Thank you for allowing me to experience these things. Because if it's not that, then it's Satan using us to have a domino effect in the wrong, wrong way. Let's pray. Father, we love you this morning. We are so thankful, Lord, that you use people. Father, help us to love people. Help us to be passionate about how much people need to know you. Father, I am so thankful that you use me in the ways that you do. I'm amazed that you want to. I'm amazed that you can. But Lord, I pray you help us to think big. Help us to dream big. Help us, Lord, to look at this room and think, there's not going to be enough room in here for everyone. We're going to reach the city for you. God, we're going to see revival done through your power. And I pray you'd allow us to be a part of that. Your word says that you're looking for true worshipers. Father, help us to figure out what that is and become it. That you'd see us here, Lord. With no prejudice. With no desire to do anything for ourselves. But Lord, we want to be used by you. Be with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. No one looking around. I wonder if you're here this morning. You say, Pastor Ken, I want to be used greatly of God. And I need to, I need to surrender him, to him. A part of who I am. But he'd allow me to surrender and be used in his ideas this domino effect of him using my part of my life that maybe seemed insignificant to me, but really this morning he's getting a hold of my heart, telling me that I need to surrender this part of myself to him so that he might use me in a great way. 
I'm not saying this morning you know how he's going to do it. I'm not saying this morning that you know all the answers. All that I'm asking you this morning is you would just simply say, Lord, I desire it. I'm here. Make me to be that true worshiper. Find me. Use me in this area of affecting people well beyond my capability. I wonder if this morning you'd be willing to lay down that part of yourself and say, God, use me in that way. Help me not get caught up in useless arguments and to love people more than myself. I wonder if that's you this morning. Just raise your hand up real quick and say, God, that's me. Use me in that way. You're doing that to God, not me. Just publicly, Lord, use me in that way. I surrender to you. Thank you for your honesty. I wonder if this morning you would just say, Pastor, I'm going through a really difficult time. Just pray for me. Just a lot of things I'm going through. I'm hurting in my heart. Not everybody knows about every detail. I'm just hurting. Just pray for me. I'm not embarrassed. I'm not calling you up. Just raise your hand up to the Lord. Lord, I'm hurting. I need you to heal me. What do you know? All right, let's pray together. Father, we do love you. I thank you for these precious people here you brought here. Lord, I pray in some way that this was a blessing to them. I pray you'd use it in a powerful way. Lord, that we can be able to reach people that are beyond our hey. capability. Father, help us to have eternity in view. That a kind word, a kind action can go so far. And in the same way, a perfect word can cut so deep. Help us to be aware of the effects that we have on others. Help us, Lord, have you in mind as we do this. Help us to emulate who you are in the story of John 4. Lord, we're so thankful for it. We're so thankful for this church. I pray you continue to guide us, and I pray, Lord, more than anything else, that you alone will be the leader of this place. You'll do something amazing that we all know is you. Father, I pray you be with these precious people this week. Help us to go and, and do battle with the world and be a witness for you. And I pray, Lord, you be with the Campbells this week as they make a journey up north, keep them safe, Father. Thank you for all you've done in our lives. In Jesus' precious name. Hey guys, thank you so much for being here. We're a little late. Sorry. But uh, that was a long passage, so I don't know. I'm just going to blame the Bible. Is that okay? I don't know. <laughs> Listen, I love you all so much. Thank you for being here. Let's be loving on each other. You are dismissed.